from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First Christian Church welcomes you today, January 23rd, 2022. I will be Chris today. Announcements. If you would please turn to the back of your bulletin for announcements. Monday, our new Bible study will be at 1 p.m. Wednesday, Bible study will be at 6 p.m. and choir rehearsal will follow at 7 p.m. Everyone is invited. Uh, you can see the duties uh, for next Sunday, January 30th. Remember that the church is collecting food and money uh, donations for the Super Bowl Sunday today and ne the next two Sundays. If you choose to make a monetary donation using a check, please make checks out to the Good Samaritan Food Pantry. Our offerings will be delivered to the Good Samaritan Food Pantry Sunday, February 13th. Please don't forget to pick up an extra uh, can or two on your next shopping trip for the Good Samaritan Food Pantry, and we will also deliver those uh, at the same time. The Bible study scripture for this coming week is Luke 15, 1 through 32, the Lost Parables. Also, you'll see an address um, for Gabriel Payne. He is a high school student that uh, has been battling cancer, and he, um, Chris was telling me that he really enjoys having cards sent to him, so if you'd like to send him a card, uh, the address is on the back of the bulletin there. Are there any other announcements? Hello. We are still trying to update the church email list, um, so if you could uh, shoot me an email. My email, I believe, is printed on the back of the bulletin. It is. Yes, it is. Um, with what your email address is, we're trying to send the newsletters out to people through email who want them and we have the church email account set up but we do not have names associated with the email addresses and the contacts so if you could just send me an email with what your email address is that would be greatly appreciated thank you are there any other announcements if not we'll move on to the passing of the peace may the peace of christ be with you and now i will move on to the call to worship, and I've chosen Psalm 100. Shout to jo for joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. And now we'll move on to our first hymn, which is Victory in Jesus, all verses, page one or page three fifty three.
of invocation? Pray, please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we are here in your sanctuary this morning to honor and worship you. We thank you for the promises found in the Bible that encourage and remind us that as our Heavenly Father, you love us with an extraordinary love. A love so powerful that you sent your only son, Jesus, to die for the forgiveness of each of our sins. We are so underserving of your mercy and love. We are thankful for your forgiveness when we fail to do your will. We ask that you be with us and guide, bless, and protect each of us this week. Give us strength when we are tempted to go against your will. Use us as your hands, feet, voice, and heart as we go as your disciples into this world, which, in this, in, which is in desperate need of your message of love and forgiveness. Please be with Melissa this morning as she delivers your message. Let us join as a worship, worshipful congregation this morning in praying your perfect Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. of sharing. Does anyone have a moment of share to share? I would ask you to be in my in prayers for my nephew Malachi. Um, three weeks ago, my brother Donnie and his son Will tested positive for COVID. Will this week, my brother, other brother Josh texted us that Malachi, who's 11, tested positive for COVID. Um, he is home. Josh said he's feeling pretty cruddy. Luckily, uh, his older and younger sister, Eliah and Willow, tested negative, so they are at their mom's house for the next two weeks, and Malachi is with Josh at his house. Um, so prayers that Josh and Eliah and Willow don't get it, and that Malachi feels better soon. Thank you. Anyone else have a moment to share? Uh, love. I'd like to just say that uh, Haley and Luke have been renting for three years this house that's been wonderful. And uh, they just found out uh, that they're going to have to move, which is really horrible because it's the only home that the little ones have known. And it's big and nice and full of stuff. So would you all just keep them in your prayers because it's going to be a big task and a hard one. To work around the little ones too, so I appreciate that. Anybody else have a moment to share? Uh, I'll share something. Um, if you would just keep um, mom and I in your prayers this week, I, I travel back to uh, UVA for a, a doctor's appointment. It's not for cardiology, it's for dermatology. Um, but the last time I was there, they did a biopsy on a spot on my shoulder, so I'm hoping for clear news that I don't have any have to have anything biopsied and everything looks good. All right, now we'll move on to our second hymn, Blessed Be the Tides That Bind, all verses, page 426.
will refer to the insert of your bulletin as I read the names and recent additions to our prayer list. The family of Alice C. Brown, the family of Ray Jones, Alpha Potter, Amanda Coleman, Ann Cordell Arno, Art Novak, Bill Duff, Brady Hess, Brenda Lawson, Chris Leonard, Clinton Evans, David Sims, Debbie Spencer, Dwayne Keene, Diana Mill Mead, Dylan Mead, Donna Cantrell, Elizabeth Thomas, Flora Lawson, Ernest Lane, Franklin Lawson, Gabe Payne, Jean Potter, Heather McLaughlin, Glenn Wright Jr., Global pa Pandemic Patients, Irene and Eli Bailey, Jackie Blevins, James Lane, Jamie Stanley, Irene and Jeffrey Mills, James Church, Jeff Carter, Jimmy Grindstaff, Johnny Avon, Karen Murphy, Kelly McKean, Kenneth Barnett, Lee Wampler, Lauren Murphy, Madison Hartner, Main Street School, Larry Puckett, Malachi Snyder, Michael Harmon, Patty Pruitt, Robin Cunningham, Roy Del Keen, Sadie Mackey, The Sawyers Family, Shonda Richardson, Stephanie, Tazewell County Public Schools, Terry Blacken, Tornado Victims, Trudell Allisey, The Ernest Family, Tim Scott, Unspoken Request, Wanda Lawson, Young Family, Zach Yates, Ellis Harmon, Claude Branch, and now Reverend Melissa will lift these names up in prayer. Let us come before God. Creating and redeeming God, we are so incredibly enthralled to be in your holy presence today. We know that it is cold outside, but here our hearts are lit with a burning passion for you that nothing in the world can quench or stop from burning higher for you. We come into your house of worship this morning, dear God, and our souls are at rest to be here, to be in your presence, to feel your comfort and your care, to meditate on your holy scriptures and see how it is that you have ordained our lives to be lived. As we sing praises to your holy name, reminding us of the saving blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And we sing our praises to you for all that you and he have done to give to us all eternal life in your great and glorious kingdom. We truly have so much to be thankful for this morning, Heavenly Father, as we gather in your holy presence. For we know last week we were kept apart by snow and ice, and this week we rejoice that we can once again be physically together as we worship your holy name. We rejoice in the great and wonderful things that happened in our lives this week, blessings that might have been small but meant so much to us. A phone call from a friend, a card or a letter from someone we haven't heard for in a while, Somebody holding the door to it for us as we went into the grocery store and greeting us with a smile, a hello, and won't you have a nice day. Things that brought a smile to our face. We know that these are all the workings of your hand. And we give you thanks, dear God, for the many blessings, the moments in our lives this week that made us smile, that made us think of you in the creation that you brought into being. We pray, dear God, that your blessings continue to pour down upon us. And not only that we would receive such blessings, but also that we would go forth in your holy name, sharing those blessings with others in this world, so that we can make other people smile, 
so that we can give them a happy thought that turns to you and your creation. Let us, dear God, go forth in your holy name, sharing of your love and kindness with this world. We also come before you and we lift before you those cares and concerns on our prayer list, those that we carry in our heart. And we pray for your holy and loving spirit to be with all of those people whose names were spoken out loud and those silent requests that are known only to us. For we know, dear God, that our burdens are great. And we come and we lay them before you. And we trust in your leading, your guiding, and your caring for our lives and for theirs. We trust that everything will be as you have called it to be. We pray, dear God, for your Holy Spirit to be upon those who are ill and hurting, for those who are grieving, for those who have so much on their plate right now, for those with upcoming travels and doctor's appointments. Holy Father, may your comforting Holy Spirit be on them, helping to ease their anxieties. May they have safe travels and get home safe. We pray this day and every day, dear God, as we pray in the prayer that Jesus taught us to not be led into temptation. May we continue to faithfully rely on your own understanding and not our own. May we continue to look to you for guidance in the path of righteousness that you have laid before us. And may we do our best to walk it. We know that we will be faced with temptations and may we have strong enough faith to say no. We know that we will be faced with challenges and obstacles, and may we be strong in our faith to overcome. We pray, dear God, that we would continue to follow the example of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who lived and died and gave of himself for us. May we, too, live by his example. May we show everybody what it means to be a follower of our Lord and Savior what it means to walk the path that you have set before us. May all that we do, Heavenly Father, be done in love and to glorify your holy name. In your Son's name we pray. Amen. of the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made on our behalf so that we all can gather around this sacred table and join together in this holy feast. If you would please join me in our communion hymn number 310, Lead Me to Calvary. We will sing verses 1 and 2, and we will stand on verse 4.
Jesus partook of that last supper with his disciples, we think about who was at that table. Jesus, who would be, or Judas, who would betray him, Peter, who would deny him, the brothers James and John, who were fighting amongst themselves and the other disciples over who was the favorite. If Jesus can sit and dine with all of them, he can sit and dine with all of us. That no matter what you have done in your life, what other people have told you you have done, how grievous you think your crimes might be, Christ invites us each and every time that we gather together to come to this holy table and dine with him. And thanks be to God for that. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took the loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks for it, he broke it and said, This is my body given for you. Take and eat. Do so in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup also after supper and said, This is the cup of the new covenant sealed in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink, all of you, of it. And as often as you do, do so in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Most gracious God and Heavenly Father, once again I want to thank you for the privilege and opportunity that we have to come to this your table. And Father, as we partake of this bread that represents your son's Jesus Christ, broken and bruised body that hung on a cross, help us to remember and reflect on the pain, the suffering, and embarrassment that he bore out of his love for each and every one of us. For this I pray in your most holy and precious name. I continue my brother's prayer, Father, for the cup, which does symbolize your Son and our Savior's shed blood on Calvary for remission of our sins. Lord, we thank you so much for the supreme sacrifice that paved the road for our salvation. We thank you for this opportunity for eternal life. Lord, again, we thank you for all the many blessings you have bestowed upon each one of us. Lord, I just ask that you continue to lead, guide, and direct each one of us, and that you would help us to live our lives more according to your will. Thank you again for everything. In Christ's most holy and precious name I pray. Amen. As often as you eat of this bread and you drink of this cup, you proclaim the living Lord's death until he comes again. Let us have a prayer over the offering. Heavenly Father, we are reminded in the Gospel of Luke the story of the widow's might, the woman who gave two tiny small pennies all that she had to help build up your kingdom. We come to you this day, dear God, giving to you our offerings all that we have to help build up your kingdom. We pray that these gifts might be blessed and multiplied that they might be used to help bring about your glory upon this earth. In your son's holy name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, turn this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world and said, I will give you all their authority and splendor as it has been given to me, and I give it to anyone that I want to. If you worship me, it will be yours. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you do not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus answered, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all of this tempting, he left him until a more opportune time. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. We have all been tempted before, and we're all guilty of giving in to that temptation, if even only on the rare occasion. It is human nature. I spent half of my childhood grounded because rather than running away from the evil and praying to be delivered from it, I usually ran toward whatever was tempting me, with gusto and then fully embraced it in my life. I remember once I was grounded because my very best friend about that time, when I was nine, lived across the street from me, and her name was Charity, and her and I wanted to go to the community pool. The community pool in the town where I grew up was just behind our house, and my parents had no qualms about letting us children go over all day, every day by ourselves. Charity's mother, on the other hand, would not let her go unless she or my mother was going to be there. Charity's mother, Jane, had had an accident as a child, and she nearly drowned, and as of this, she was very afraid of large bodies of water. And so she was very hesitant to let Charity go to the pool unless there was adult supervision. Even though there were lifeguards, you have two or three lifeguards watching over 80 kids, Jane required that for Charity to go to the pool, Jane had to go herself or my mother had to go. Well, one day it was hot and Charity and I really wanted to go to the pool. So me, being the very good friend that I am, we came up with this idea that we would tell Jane my mother was going, and we would tell my mother, who knew Jane's rule, that Jane was going with us. And we giddily ran through the backyard, having reveled in the glory from tricking our parents, or so we thought. It did not cross our nine-year-old minds that we were next-door neighbors and our parents would see each other out and about. When we got home that evening, I think the pool closed around 5.30 or 6, we were, of course, in trouble. To say that our parents were angry was an understatement. We got reamed out in the driveway so that all of the neighbors could see and hear, and we were told about lying and deception and the imminent death we could have been facing at the pool. And to be honest, neither Charity or I were really listening to what our parents were saying. But after the yelling was done, Jane and my mother took pity on us and said before our grounding began, you'll see why I'm using air quotes in a minute, but before our grounding began, we were allowed to take one more bike ride, because before the pool opened at 12, we just ride our bikes through town all day. And here is where we got into even more trouble and allowed ourselves to be led into greater temptation. You see, our parents had this rule that when the street lights came on, you came home. And our parents told us we could take one more bike ride for the day, but they did not exactly put a time limit on how long we could be gone. So I think you all kind of see where this is going. Three hours later, we return home. Again, Charity and I are getting 
yelled at in the driveway, when we tried to remind our mothers that we were home when the street lights came on, we are innocent here, that somehow did not help the situation at all. We're told that we're never going to see the light of day again, you know, when we are 80 and collecting Social Security, then we can be friends again. Mom and I go into the house. Dad comes up to see what's going on. He has no idea that any of this has transpired. He's got four other kids he's trying to keep out of trouble. And he asks my mother what's wrong. And so my mother proceeds to tell him what happened. And I again said I was just being a good friend, ensuring that Charity could go to the pool and we were still home by the time the streetlights came on. I am wrongly accused. And my dad says, well, you know, the youth group, is taking a trip to Kentucky Kingdom tomorrow and -and so-and-so can't go. We have two extra tickets. I was going to see if Melissa and Charity wanted to go. So I'll go call Charity right now. So I ran across the house, picked up the phone. Keep in mind, we at this point have been grounded for about four minutes. Jane answers the phone. I tell her what's going on. And she's like, sure, Charity can go tomorrow. What does she need to bring? What time does she need to be there? And that was the end of our punishment. We went to an amusement park the next day, and after that, Jane did not care if Charity went to the pool so long as I went with her. Shortest punishment I've ever had in my life. However, just because Charity and I were not punished for what we did does not excuse our behavior, and it does not make the temptation that we allowed ourselves to be led into acceptable. Today, our scripture reading comes Immediately following the baptism of Jesus, Jesus is an adult now. We're told he is about 30 years of age. He was baptized in the Jordan River by his cousin John. And as Jesus comes up out of those holy waters, the heavens broke open. The Spirit of God in the form of a dove descends and a voice speaks, This is my Son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. And right after Jesus was baptized, we read the Holy Spirit of God led Jesus into the desert where we are then told Jesus was tempted continually day and night for 40 days. William Barclay, in his commentary on this passage, he describes this desert where Jesus is. He writes, Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness for a time of trials and sufferings. The place where Jesus was led is a stretch of wilderness in a place between Jerusalem and the Dead Sea known as the Devastation. It is a very fitting name. It stretched over 35 miles, and this is where Christ stayed for 40 days and 40 nights fighting off starvation and hell. Famous Scottish theologian George Adam Smith described the wilderness where Jesus was as this. It is an area of yellow sand, of crumbling limestone and scattered shingle. It is an area of contorted strata where the ridges run in all direction as if they were warped and twisted. The hills are like dust heaps. The limestone is blistered and peeling. The rocks are jagged and bare. The ground sounds hollow when a foot or horse hoof falls upon it. It glows and shimmers with heat like a vast furnace. It runs right out to the Dead Sea, where then comes a drop of 1,200 feet of flint and marl through crags and quarries down to the Dead Sea. In this wilderness, Jesus could not have been more alone. But Jesus was led into the wilderness to be alone. His task had come to him. God had spoken to him, and he was to think of how he was going to attempt the task that God had laid before him. He had to get things straightened out before he could start. This is why he was led into the wilderness. He had to be alone to prove that he would not, could not, succumb to the temptations laid before him, to show that he could rightfully do the work that God had chosen him to do. So Jesus is tempted in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights. Mark's gospel does not specifically list what those temptations are, but the gospels of Matthew and Luke do. And today in the gospel of Luke, we are told that Jesus was first tempted to turn stones into bread. Now, at this point, we are not told specifically how long it is that Jesus has been in the desert, but the scriptures we can infer that it is nearing the end of his 40 days, at which point Jesus must have been absolutely famished. 
and that temptation to turn stones into bread would have been great. How many of us, after not eating for a few hours, make the quip that we are so hungry we could eat a horse? Times when we feel that we are so hungry that if we do not eat something, we will actually be sick because we haven't eaten. When we are then that hungry and we are afforded the opportunity to eat, anything will suffice, even food that we don't like, because we are just that hungry. We then proceed to eat to allow ourselves to be made full, and we feel better because we are no longer hungry. But more than just a physical hunger, we sometimes also feel a spiritual hunger, And we look to feel that hunger and to feed on that in other ways than turning to Christ. Just as the devil tempted Christ, the devil tempts us. We feel spiritually hungry and we feel that hunger with hobbies, working harder and longer at our jobs, joining every single activity or social group that we can think of, bi-weekly lunches with friends, joining the baseball league, whatever. Sometimes we feel slightly better, but it is usually a short-lived feeling because the type of hunger that we have and how we are looking to quench it cannot be filled with activities no matter how many we try. It can only be filled by turning to Jesus Christ. But we often ignore that because we don't like what Jesus has to say in terms of how we fill that spiritual hunger. What Jesus has to say makes us uncomfortable. So we plead ignorance to what Christ says to us, and we look for other avenues and ways that that spiritual hunger might be satisfied. Or we just don't want to do what Jesus calls us to do to fill, fill that spiritual hunger. We claim incompetence. Well, Jesus called me to do that, and I know that I can't, so I'm not even going to try. And then we just go about our merry way. Other times, people look to fill this hunger with alcohol and drugs, gambling, shopping. But the spiritual hunger that we have in our soul cannot be quenched by other worldly pursuits. The devil tries to tell us that the spiritual hunger we feel can be satisfied with earthly material goods, but that's only because the devil exists to keep us separated further and further from Christ. We feel a physical hunger in our lives, so we eat. We feel a spiritual hunger, and the only way that hunger can be filled is by turning to Christ. Next, Jesus is tempted to fling himself off a building and let the angel save him. Jesus tells Satan, we do not test the Lord our God. We try to test the Lord. We try to make barters with God. Dear God, if I pass this test that I didn't study for, please, please, please believe me, I will never tell another lie ever again. That in and of itself is a lie. And then we fail the test due to our own personal lack of preparation. We get mad. If only God had let me pass that test, I'm never speaking to him again. Okay, you do that and you let me know how that goes. There's an episode of MASH, and it's late one night, and the surgeons and the nurses run out, and they're unloading the casualties, and as the doctors are unloading all these patients, a sniper opens fire on the camp. The whole camp is in a panic, and rightfully so. After the sniper is removed from the situation, the doctors go in, and they get ready for surgery, and as they're in the scrub room, Charles takes off his hat and sees there's a bullet hole in his hat and his hat had been sitting up just enough on his head that the bullet passed through without him noticing. He came within inches of dying. Charles becomes manic with thoughts of death. He begins to think of his life, of his brother he had who died as an infant, and he just has this overwhelming consummation with death. When his thoughts about his life and his brother are no longer enough to keep him satisfied with thinking about death. He takes up a bedside vigil beside one of the men who he had performed surgery on who was close to coming to death and continually asks him what it was like to be so close to death. Charles then becomes upset when that young man cannot tell Charles anymore 
So then Charles, still needing more, takes a jeep and drives to an aid station out the front lines without the permission of Colonel Potter. And Charles is obsessed with being at the aid station, of talking to the men who were badly hit and aren't going to make it. When Colonel Potter finally manages to get Charles on the phone, Colonel Potter says to Charles, didn't you ever stop to think that by being there you could die? And Charles said the thought had crossed his mind, but only ever so briefly. Charles became fanatical with needing to know what death was like, that he kept pushing the boundaries to learn more. Who of us has children did not push the boundaries of the rules our parents put into place, like sneaking off to the pool and then participating in the Tour de Owingsville with your friend? It isn't very different when it comes to our faith in God. We know what God commands each of us to do, but that doesn't stop us from pushing the bounds of our faith. It doesn't stop us from pushing the bounds of God's patience to see how far it is that we can go before we feel God step in and stop us. But we do not test God. We do not try to barter with God. We do not make back alley deals with God. God does not exist in our lives to be a genie in a bottle. God does not exist in our lives so that we can test our limits of what is morally or spiritually acceptable. And finally, Jesus is tempted that if he bows down to the devil, then the devil will give him the whole earth as his kingdom. Except when you stop to think about it, the earth is not the devil's to give away. The devil is not the one whose presence hovered over the darkness of the earth while it was formless and void. The devil did not create the sky and the sea and the moon and the stars and, his, and everything else that was brought into being. The devil did not send his one and only son into the world to redeem the creation that he made. So how is it the devil can promise to Christ the world? This would be like me renting out the parsonage. The parsonage is not mine to rent out. We are tempted all the time to give up something in return for something that we think is even greater. Ariel gave up her voice in The Little Mermaid so she could become a human to meet Prince Eric, but there was a caveat, wasn't there? But there always is. The world promises to us things that we want in exchange for something that A, might not be within the world's power to give, or B, the extent of what we are giving up is not so abundantly clear, and we end up giving up way more than we ever bargained for. God gives to us what is sufficient for our daily lives. We might think that we don't have enough, but we do. And a lot of times, it's not so much that we don't have enough, it's we don't like what we have, which is an entirely different thing. We want what everyone else has. We want the brand name items. We have this idea that we have to constantly keep up with the Joneses. We have this idea that we are better than other people, so we most certainly deserve more. But God's providence for us is more than sufficient. We just have to recognize that what the world tries to give us is actually not within the power of the world to give us. And what we might be getting is far worse than what we ever could have possibly imagined. Jesus Christ was tempted in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights. It was, I am sure, hard, but Christ, as we know, arose and he was victorious. And he set the example for all of us to follow. There will be times when we will be tempted and we will be able to withstand the temptation that stands in front of us. Other times we will fail and we will give in to that temptation. That's fine. That's life. We're human beings. We are fallible. However, in those moments when we are not as strong as we would like, we will get through it. And we will learn from it. And we will move on so that the next time we will be stronger. The world will try to ensnare us. The world will try to trick us into thinking it's right and only the world can fill the hunger that we feel in our soul. That only the world has the power to give us what we want. But the world is not the ultimate power. God is. Only God can fill our souls. Only God can give us what we need. Only God has the power 
to help us overcome whatever temptations there are that exist in the world. Christ knew that. That is why he was able to resist the workings of the devil when he was in the desert. We know it too. With faith in the power of God, we are stronger than we think. With faith in the power of God, we will be able to overcome whatever it is that we are tempted by. With faith in the power of God, we will have everything that we ever will need. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we know that we are tempted each and every day to go against your will. But help us, dear God, to stand firm in our faith and to follow the path of righteousness you have laid before us all. Help us, dear God, to not give so easily into temptations that come to us and ensnare us. Help us, dear God, to encourage others as they walk this path. And may all that we do be done in love and in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Paul wrote in his letter to the Hebrews to let go of everything that is sinful and so easily entangles. If you have heard Christ calling out to you to let go of sin and everything that so easily entangles and to work within our church to help build up the kingdom of God, I invite you to come forward during our hymn of invitation, number 571, Trust and Obey. We will sing verses 1 and 2. Would you please stand? Resisting temptations when you can, receiving forgiveness of God when you can't. And remember that Jesus forgives all of us who earnestly come into his presence. And may the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.